Hey there. This is co-editor Jen Albert, here to tell you about a small opportunity at PodCastle. We're looking to grow our diverse team of associate editors, also known as slush readers. These heroes help us tackle our dragon's horde-sized pile of short story submissions. And who better to ask than our own listeners? As an associate editor, you'd be reading incoming submissions and helping us decide what stories we publish, working to shape PodCastle for the future. Plus, slush reading is a great opportunity to level up your own writing while reading some truly fabulous fantasy fiction. And as a part of the Escape Artists family, should you choose to, you'll have the opportunity to develop skills associated with podcasting and publishing, including editing and proofreading, audio production, narration, hosting, marketing, and fundraising. If you're interested, send us an email at editor at podcastle.org for more information. You have until April 6th to apply. Now, on with the show. Podcastle, episode 567 for March 26th, 2019. The Weaver Retires by Kai Hudson. Rated PG 13 for needles and blackest thread. Hello everyone, welcome to PodCastle. I'm your host, Setsu Uzume, and this week's episode is the last stop for Artemis Rising 5. The final story for this cycle The Weaver Retires was written for you by Kai Hudson. Kai Hudson lives in sunny California where she writes, hikes, and spends entirely too much time daydreaming of far-off worlds. Her work has appeared or is forthcoming in Clark's World, Pseudopod, Metaphorosis, and Anathema, Speck from the Margins, among others. This week's narrator is Jen Albert. Jen Albert is an entomologist, writer, editor, narrator, game player, cosplayer, streamer, reader of all the things, and haver of far too many hobbies. Jen somehow became co-editor of her favorite fantasy fiction magazine and podcast, and she now wonders if she's still allowed to call it her favorite. She is a production editor at Toronto-based book publisher ECW Press. Jen lives in Toronto with her very large, very hairy German Shepherd. And now... Put the camera down, and enjoy the story. The Weaver Retires by Kai Hudson Read by Jen Albert They come from all over. Exotic, far-off places with names Weissa can barely pronounce. Australia. Japan. Venezuela. Last week, some alien-sounding place called Pennsylvania. Her grandson, Ashti, says they come because she's famous. She's on the internet, he tells her. This great big place like a temple in the air, full of books and magazines anyone can read at any time. Apparently someone wrote about her a few months ago, and that's why people come. She doesn't mind it so much. They break out the monotony of the day, when she comes back from feeding the pigs or killing cockroaches with her sandals to find yet another foreigner sitting awkwardly with Ashti inside the hut. Today, it is one of the ones with skin like someone dusted him with bread flour, with a balding head and damp patches decorating his brightly colored shirt. A fat woman, presumably his wife, slumps in Ashti's usual chair, fanning herself with her hat. Ashti has politely moved to the floor. Ah, Ima, her grandson says, rising upon her entrance. The foreigners don't move. We have visitors. She's always amused when he uses that word. When Wiza was little, visitors meant aunts and cousins from the next village over, or perhaps traders from afar, their donkeys laden with bright plastic toys and exotic candies that burst like bubbles of honey on her tongue. If they were really lucky, visitors meant a small group of slightly bedraggled people, lean and dusty from travel who smiled with gaps in their teeth and offered, in exchange for food and lodging, her absolute favorite thing. Stories. 
The weavers, as they were called, were a spectacle throughout the village. A visit from them meant hot food and laughter shared late into the night, music and dancing around roaring bonfires, and of course the stories. Flashes of light and threads of darkness twisting through the air like errant snakes, setting their hearts afire with tales of brave warriors in faraway battles, great floods and seasons of bountiful harvest. If Wysa had been very good, her mother would let her have a story, and many a time she would fall asleep in an adult's lap as dawn broke over the horizon, dizzy with the magic of her skin. Wysa nods at her grandson and starts across the hut, intending to fetch the small cookie tin sitting next to her sleeping mat. The white man, however, heaves himself up with much effort and stands in her way to jam his hand forward. He smiles and says, Hallo, I'm Erbert, which she assumes is a greeting in his language. She smiles back and shakes his hand. It's greasy with sweat and he squeezes too hard, making her knuckles ache, but she makes sure not to show it on her face. They've journeyed very far to see her. She doesn't want to make them uncomfortable. The man's wife stops fanning long enough to bark something at her husband, but doesn't seem able to summon energy for much more than that. The man nods and lifts the heavy camera hanging from around his neck, turning to say something to Ashti as he indicates Weissa's bare arms. Ashti shrugs permission. He knows Weissa doesn't mind. And she doesn't. Even as the man follows her across the hut, camera going click, click, click as he photographs the stories inked all over her skin. She doesn't mind at all. Stories are meant to be remembered. And if this is how they do it in today's world, not with needle and thread, but with a big clunky machine, then so be it. She bends slowly and picks up the tin, unable to help a soft groan as her back dutifully protests. It seems everything in her body is going these days. The stiffness in her ankles, the painful grinding of her knees, her swollen finger joints and fading eyesight. Nicola, her great-granddaughter, says she calculated it, and Wysa is over 90 years old. That's almost a century, she'd said the last time they spoke on the phone. Like it was an important thing. Wysa doesn't really understand. The stories she weaves are much, much older. She motions for the man to go outside. He does and with a loud, whooshing sigh that dramatically announces how difficult this all is, his wife gets up and does the same. Ashti smiles sheepishly. Sorry, Ima, they came a long way. Did they come from the internet? Wysa asks, and suddenly doesn't really know why Ashti laughs. The world is a strange place nowadays. In the patch of cracked dirt outside the hut, The foreigner's wife has already plopped herself down in the only shaded area beneath the grassy awning, leaving her husband to sit awkwardly, cross-legged under the sun, just outside the door. Ashti immediately goes back to fetch the umbrella. It's bright orange with some foreign company's logo on it, a gift from the people who came a few months ago and did whatever they did to put her on the internet. It doesn't always open right, and one of the spokes snapped off a while back. But Ashti manages to wrestle it into position, standing over Wysa to provide some relief from the relentless sun as she squats down next to the white man and opens the tin. Inside is a set of needles, long and thin and ghostly silver. No thread. Wysa nods at the man. Where? Ashti translates for her. The man rolls up the sleeves of his shirt and points to the bare patch of his upper arm. Wysa was taught that one's first story should always be near the stomach, where the spirit resides, but she makes no objection. For some reason, most foreigners prefer the arms or the back, though she'll never know why. She doesn't ask the man what kind of story he wants. It's not his place, or hers. Stories do not come from the weavers themselves. She squints into the tin for a moment. The smell of metal and rust filling her nose as she struggles to distinguish the different needle lengths through the slow, expanding clouds of her eyes. One day she will not be able to do this anymore, when age and fatigue become too much. But today, her eyes, though blurry, can see, and her fingers, though aching, can move. 
She selects a medium length needle that glints in the sun. The man startles and draws in a hissed breath at the first puncture, laughing a bit to cover it up. Wysa ignores him and uses her thumb to swipe the blood away as she moves the needle through soft, pliant skin. Cloth rustles, and there is a movement out of the corner of her eye, the man's wife finally lumbering to her feet to lift her own camera. Click, goes the shutter, as she steps directly into Wysa's light. Click, click. Wysa doesn't say anything, just pauses for a moment, needle tips still embedded beneath the man's skin. Eventually, the wife decides she wants a better angle and moves away. When the light returns, Wysa turns the needle and forces the tip back up to pierce the air. The man gasps and trembles. The needle draws out the man's skin, trailing a thin, wispy thread of black. Wysa hums and tugs until she feels resistance about a foot later. It's not bad, really. When she was a child, people's stories were many feet long, shimmering in a rainbow of colors. Weiss's grandfather only ever had one story, but it took three days to complete and splashed color from his cheeks all the way to his ankles. By comparison, Weiss's longest story only took one night, running from the base of her neck down to her left hip. The foreigner's black thread shimmers weakly in the sunlight. His wife gasps and quickly snaps pictures. Ashti read Wysa a few articles from the internet in the beginning. People with faraway jobs living in faraway cities with faraway ideas about what it means to weave. There were many photographs of her work. And these people claimed the story was in these images. That if one were to squint and study hard and long enough one would be able to see a neat beginning, middle, and end in the blocky lines and nonsensical shapes drawn into dozens of people's foreign skin. They are wrong. Every weaver knows the story is in the thread. The man has an odd name. Herbert. The thread wants it to take the form of a teardrop, so Wysa weaves it into his skin accordingly, squinting to make sure the thread sinks in completely transforming into dark ink to cement the name Herbert. He'll turn 56 next month, and he wonders if Shelley will even remember. They haven't had sex in months because Shelley keeps saying she has migraines, even though she never has migraines when it's time to go out to the pub with her friends from the pool club. Herbert's resentment becomes a small black diamond in his skin. The next section of thread vibrates with guilt, because he feels bad about sneaking into the basement every other night to beat off to porn, but not bad enough that he thinks of stopping. He's been ogling the cute maid at their hotel all weekend, too, which has made Shelley snap at him twice. But Shelley has no right to be jealous, does she? Because she promised him she'd be better. She promised him last summer she'd start her diet and go swimming for real, and make it so he doesn't have to be married to a goddamned whale. But she doesn't keep her end of the bargain, does she? So he's allowed to look. It's not like he's going to do anything. Three parallel black lines for Herbert's desperate disgust with his wife. The story turns, and this is where Wysa has to be especially careful. Two years from now, Shelley will find a lump in her breast. She'll be dead by the turn of the next decade, and Herbert will cry at the funeral and be relieved that he's still able to feel something for her. That she didn't kill his humanity completely. Four wavy lines for Herbert's future widower status. Six months after that, he'll meet a young 20-something with fake blonde hair, and he'll fall head over heels for her giant tits and how she laughs at all his jokes. Even the ones that aren't funny. He'll marry her by the end of the year. He'll buy her a new car and spend whatever's left of Shelley's life insurance, pay out on jewelry and dresses and fancy dinners out. Anything to keep her around. To keep her smiling and looking at him like he's the best, most important thing in the world, an eye-shaped ellipse for Herbert's naivete. When she vanishes three months after they marry, taking with her all the money in the house along with his social security number, bank cards, and retirement savings, he'll drink. Wysa is very careful now, drawing the thread around in a series of slow-expanding concentric circles. 
One rainy evening in October, Herbert will stay out late at the pub, having one too many drinks. He'll get angry. He'll get stupid. The thread is almost gone now. Only about half an inch left. Wysa bends it in close, squints down her nose at the needle to complete the final circle. A car crash at 60 miles per hour. A forehead slamming into a thick windshield hard enough to spiderweb the glass. A helicopter. Surgery. Ventilator. She must not allow her hands to slip and make a mistake. She must not accidentally save his life. Herbert's story finishes with a decision by his eldest daughter, years from now, to take him off life support. The last bit of thread sinks into skin. The curve of Herbert's upper arm, now a conglomeration of seemingly random black shapes and lines. Weiss sets the needle, bloody, down onto the lid of the cookie tin with a soft clink. There are tears in the man's eyes. From the pain, Wysa assumes, because only the weaver can see the story. She still has bits and pieces of it, enough that she remembers his name starts with a huh sound, and that he doesn't like his wife much. After a few seconds, even that fades away. The foreigner gets shakily to his feet and says something to Wysa that probably communicates gratitude. She nods. Ashi speaks with him for a few moments longer. Money changes hands, and then they're gone. Disappeared down the road in the old beat-up jeep driven by Weiss's grand-nephew. Maybe the story she wove today will be on the internet tomorrow. She doesn't think much about the story as she washes the needle and shuts the tin. It could be considered cruel, she supposes, to see someone's grim future and not do anything to change it. But that's not the expectation of a weaver. Whether someone's life is to be long and adventurous or short and boring, or any combination in between, is not for her to judge. She works the needle, not the thread. Ashti counts the money in the sun. This can buy some of that tea you like, Ima, he says. And Wysa smiles. Her grandson has never asked for a story, and she has never offered... She likes that about him, that he's a blank canvas so full of possibilities. Yet he chooses to stay here with her. He makes things easier as she is getting old. As if, in agreement, her fingers ache. She groans and massages her wrist. As she goes to fetch some cooling herbs as Wysa heads back into the hut and her sleeping mat. She eases herself onto the soft woven grass breathes in the comforting smell of home, and closes her eyes. When she dies, so will the art of weaving. That is not so bad. The world has a story in and of itself, and she is just one part of it. She takes that comfort with her into sleep. She dreams of a story. She is young, lithe, beautiful. Her skin shines clean, ready for the thread of her life. So she draws it from herself, and it is a beautiful glimmering red, the color of celebration. And so long it reaches all the way to the stars, buzzing with anticipation. She grasps the needle and weaves, in and out and up and down, through the canvas of her skin. Pictures of dragons and monsters and great houses in the sky. Handsome men and dancing women and festivals full of music and more food than she could ever eat. The story of the world, and she has been blessed to carry it. She wakes to Ashti gently shaking her shoulder. Ima, he says, and his face is as if he can't quite decide whether to smile or grimace. Ima, wake up. Nicola is here. Wysa blinks the wisps of sleep from her eyes and slowly sits up. It is late afternoon now, the sun slanting in through the door of the hut, and she can see her visitor sitting in the corner, half in shadow, half in light. She frowns and beckons. Come here, child. Her great-granddaughter shuffles forward obediently, and Weiss's heart sinks. Nicola's left eye is swollen and purple. She cradles her arm to her chest, and even with the cataracts, Weiss can distinguish the deep, Finger-shaped bruises there. Oh, child, she murmurs, opening her arms, and Nicola crawls into them, 
shaking with tears. As she explains in the background, voice a low growl, Wysa can't distinguish the words between her hearing loss and Nicola's sobs, but she doesn't have to. There is a story on Nicola's skin that Wysa doesn't weave, but it's old and deep nonetheless. Nicola quiets after a moment, enough for Wysa to catch Ashti's words. I'll kill him, he hisses, and he's already standing by the door of the hut, fists clenched, as if the story is already written. As if, in his head, he's already in the city, seeking out the owner of the hand that bruised his daughter so. I'll drag him into the street and beat him like the dog he is. I'll cut his throat. I'll shoot him through the heart. This only makes Nicola cry harder. Weiss sighs and looks at her grandson. You can't do that. You'll go to jail, and then who will take care of Nicola? And me... She doesn't add. Ashti shakes his head. It doesn't matter, he says. He can't be allowed to do this anymore, Ima. And Nicola, why do you keep going back? I told you before. Stop it, Wysa snaps. And Ashti's mouth shuts with an audible click. She strokes her great-granddaughter's soft black hair and sighs. We're all tired. Nicola has come a long way. Let's all eat dinner and have some peaceful conversation and then go to sleep. We can talk about it more in the morning. But Ima, that's all, Nanu. And with that, all the fight leaves Ashti in a breath. His shoulders slump and he nods, turning to fetch the old tea kettle from the corner. Nicola stirs in Weiss's arms. Her great-granddaughter lifts her head and wipes tears from her face. Don't worry, Amima, she says. And it breaks Weiss's heart how reedy thin her voice is. Fake bravado stretched taut over a yawning chasm of despair. I won't go back. Not this time, I promise. Me and Diago are done. Wysa smiles at that and hopes it looks encouraging. She gently wipes a last tear from Nicola's cheek with her thumb before resting her hand on the story that starts at the girl's collarbone. Nicola asked her to do it when she turned 16, and it's just a small one, only reaching past the curve of her breast. Wysa wants Nicola to be like her, to have several stories that honor the change and choices she makes in her life. Right now, though, she feels only sadness as her fingers tingle with the echoes of the girl's future. She already knows how this story goes. That night, she can't sleep. Wysa lies on the mat and stares up at the hut ceiling, at the bits of black sky visible through the thick grass. Ashti's snores drift from the other side of the hut, a slow, comfortable rumble. Nicola's warmth settles reassuringly at her side. She turns to regard the girl. Nicola twitches in her sleep now, cries out occasionally even, and Wysa knows this is because of Diego and the meanness in his eyes. There's a full moon tonight so she can make out the curve of Nicola's bare shoulder, and this close she can see the scars, a long diagonal stretch that might have been accidental, and beneath it a ragged, ugly burn that is decidedly not. The anger isn't new. You don't get to be as old as Wysa without having seen things like that sometimes make shutters come down behind your eyes, make you want to lock yourself away from the world for a while and want nothing to do with stories. But that is dangerous too, and Wysa has a choice. Weavers are storytellers, not story makers. Wysa is a medium for a person's story thread. She draws it into whatever shape or pattern it wishes to take but she never dictates. She never alters the ink. But she loves Nicola, and she's getting old. Perhaps here, on this cusp of night, when the last weaver in the world is in the twilight of her days, something can change. Nicola doesn't stir when Wysa slowly rises off the mat. She is exhausted from her journey, 
and from Diego before that. Even so, Wysa tiptoes to the back corner of the hut. She feels out the slight depression in the dirt there by memory, and begins to dig. The soil is arid and dusty and throws up the scent of dried-up things. Wysa ignores it. Her hands flare up in pain at the exertion, but she ignores that too, because the object she is looking for is not buried very deep. In fact, there. Cool metal against her fingers. She draws the pair of scissors from the earth and blows on it to get the dirt off. It is made of the same material as her needles, but has seen far less use. Nicola complies with barely a snuffle when Wysa returns to the sleeping mat and gives her shoulder a gentle nudge, encouraging her to shift onto her back. The moonlight reveals her story, all done up in multicolored experiences, and it takes no time at all for Wysa to find the piece she is looking for. A two-inch long band of black just above the heart. It sends a tiny fish in through her when she touches it. An echo of love, hate, fear, pain, and a mixture of memories, some happy, most sad, and all featuring the same young man with glittering coals for eyes. The thread materializes when she asks it to, lifting up from the skin and manifesting from ink fiber without hesitation. She is the weaver, after all. Wiza bends close. She must be very careful, and make sure to cut in the right places. Snip. The start of the black band. That sunny afternoon in the park when Nicola first looked over her laughing friend's shoulder and caught a glimpse of a toned body and the most handsome face she had ever seen. Snip. The end of the band. Diego's sneering, flushed red face an instant before his fist ate up her whole vision and exploded the world in bright, white agony. Wysa sets the scissors down and regards the limp length of black thread now, pinched between her fingers. Such a small, insignificant thing for a small, insignificant man. Below her, Nicola shifts in her sleep and lets out a sigh. For the first time that night, her shoulders relax into complete peace. With a tiny shudder like a dying earthworm, the thread disintegrates. Wysa lets out a breath. When she wakes in the morning, Nicola will not remember anything of a savage named Diago. But Wysa will, and she is not done. She packs only what she needs. Some bread and fruit, an old plastic bottle half full of water, and Nicola's ID card printed with her current address. She reburies the scissors and leaves the needles where they are. Ashi will understand. When the dawn wakes him tomorrow and he sees his grandmother is gone, he will know that she decided to write her own story. It takes her a day and a half to get to the city. It's a confusing mess, especially since she can't read any of the signs or understand the dozens of different languages being barked and shouted all around her. Most of the people brush her by in a hurry to live their lives, running from one place to the next and yammering on their phones like it means something. But some are polite. The bus driver doesn't change her fare because she doesn't know she has to pay for it, and tells her which direction to walk so she can reach Nicola's neighborhood. A middle-aged woman who could pass for Nicola's mother, may the gods bless her with great stories in heaven, walks several blocks with her to locate the exact apartment building, and even offers to accompany her in the elevator up to Nicola's floor. Wysa politely but firmly declines. She will be the only witness for this. The man who answers her knock is the same face she cut from Nicola's story the previous night. There are bags under his eyes. He is unshaven and unkempt, and the scent of alcohol clings to him like a coat. He snorts, swallows mucus, and looks Wysa up and down. Yeah, who are you? Wysa smiles. Hello, Diago. I am Nicola's great-grandmother. Oh, the weaver. Diego instantly looks wary, but it seems his mother did not raise him as a complete buffoon. He shuffles aside to allow her entrance. Uh, how is she? This is a very nice house, Wysa answers. She imagines that to be at least partly true. The place is probably tiny by city standards. The garbage is overflowing, and there are a few days' worth of dishes in the sink. 
Dirty clothes on the floor and the whole place smells of beer and cigarettes. Still, it's maybe twice the size of her hut, and the sunlight shining through the grimy window paints the place in bright, cheerful yellow. Thanks. Diego shuts the door, but doesn't quite seem to know what to do about Wysa being suddenly in his home. Oh, what do you want? Wysa sighs and allows her shoulders to hunch. She sits down on the stained couch and smiles up at Diago. Nicola has told me many things about you. She begins, and instantly sees his wariness increase. Uh Uh-huh. I'd like to offer you a story. From the way Diago blinks, this was the last thing he expected. Wysa adjusts her seat on the couch and groans as her back protests. I am getting old, child. Very old. Almost a century. And as you have no doubt read on the internet, weaving will die when I die. I'm sorry, Diego says in the same flat way Ashti might say, I have to piss. I'm not bothered by it. Wysa says. But I am bothered that after I go, there will be no more stories. So I wish to weave as much as I can before the time comes. To leave a legacy, I suppose. She sees it the instant Diego understands. His eyes light. Not with joy or honor, but with greed. No doubt after she dies, those who carry her work will suddenly be very important. Such a small, insignificant man. Child, she says, looking into those dark, glinting eyes. Will you allow me to weave your story? He sinks down next to her on the couch before she's even finished the sentence. It would be an honor, Amima, he says. Wysa has to resist the urge to wince at his use of the honorific. Only family can call her that. Given the enormity of what she's about to do, though, she lets it slide. Where would you like me to start? She asks. And predictably, Diago turns and tugs his shirt off, tapping between his shoulder blades. Make it come out in a wing pattern, he says. So it's not all lopsided and ugly like Nicola's. I understand. Wysa lays a gentle hand on Diago's back. The skin there is warm, almost feverish, as if even now his body cannot contain the burning, rageful fire inside. Oh, Nicola, she thinks, I will never regret this. It takes no coaxing to draw the thread out. It's thicker than the foreigners from yesterday, solid obsidian black, and it doesn't catch the light at all seeming instead to suck it up and swallow it. Wysa tugs gently. Six inches, then eight, ten, a full foot. Then she feels it. The resistance that tells her she's reached the end. The thread vibrates against her fingers, heavy with a story, past, present, and future. Gods forgive her. She clamps her fist around the thread and yanks. The thread snaps from Diego's back with a sharp crack and a brief spout of blood. The man howls and falls forward, smashing to the coffee table and sending empty beer bottles and full ashtrays scattering every which way. Wysa leaps to her feet and plasters herself against the wall. Diego doesn't even notice. He writhes on the floor as if in a seizure, eyes shot so wide she can see the whites all around. Thick cords of vein and muscle strain down his neck and arms. His mouth opens and closes but emits only a thin, high-pitched, ah, 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 as if even language has fled him. And in a way, it has. She's breathing hard. Wysa stares down at the thread in her hands. It wriggles like a beheaded snake, twisting about as if in pain, but she keeps her grip on it, forces herself to hold on even as tears perk her eyes. The story sears through her in brief, crazy flashes. Diago is a little boy, screaming as he leaps on his father's back to protect his bruised, bleeding mother. Diago is a teenager, riding his bike as fast as he can, 
thinking that if he just aims for that wall, that rotting brick wall, and gains enough speed and doesn't stop, then maybe he'll smash and break and everything will end. Diego was a young man meeting Nicola and thinking she's pretty enough. Diego digging his dad's old revolver out of the closet when Nicola tells him she's never coming back and going to the village where she lives with her retarded backwards country family and shooting all of them in cold blood. Yes, even that shriveled old weaver grandmother of hers. Diego in prison smoking and laughing and playing cards. Diego getting released eight years later because he knows the right officials to bribe. Diego trying to find work. Diego failing. Diego alone. Diego drinking. Diego getting hit by a bus and bleeding out in the street when they wait for an ambulance that doesn't get there in time. The thread gives one last shudder and goes limp. Wiza opens her hand, fingers trembling, and the ugly black thing disintegrates into so much wispy smoke. She looks down once more at Diego, sprawled on the floor, still making those horrible, wordless sounds, and she shakes her head. May the gods bless you, she whispers, with great stories in heaven. She exits the apartment and shuts the door behind her with exaggerated care. She will never forget those terrible sounds or that awful look on his face. She will never be able to look at Nicola in the eyes again, knowing what she has done. She will die in a few years, of pneumonia, not a bullet, and make sure she never teaches anyone her craft so that the weaving of stories into skin will become a mere memory after she passes, and then eventually a folktale, and then a legend. All this will happen, and the story of the world will grind on. The wetness on her cheeks surprises her. Wysa doesn't know why she is crying, but she doesn't mind. It's a beautiful day. Ashti and Nicola are waiting for her. Wiping away tears, she asks her aged body for a little more strength and points herself in the direction of home. And welcome back. Kai Hudson had this to say about her story. This story was inspired by Fang Od, an almost century-old Filipino woman famous the world over for being the last master of traditional Kalinga tattooing. As such, Wesa's country and language, while entirely fictional, are loosely based on the Philippines with just a sprinkle of magic. Thank you for that, Kai. This story is fraught. For all the reasons, all stories are fraught. Herbert and Shelley have a bad relationship, Diago and Nicola have a bad relationship, but using the same word to describe that dynamic fails to capture the full picture of what's going on. Just like a camera can't fully capture what Wesa does. Whoever made her famous probably didn't understand either. Not fully. For my part, as a white editor, part of my job is to decolonize my perspective, which involves asking questions like, Technically, we see Herbert and Diago die on the page, but what is the impact of the way they died, and why they died, given who they were relative to each other in a story that contains Eat, Pray, Love-style tourism? The other part of my job is making sure that people who don't look or think like me are there in the room, being part of the discussions and the decisions, because my best efforts to self-educate are still no substitute for lived experience. At the same time, there are other equally important angles on this story. Wesa knew that people wouldn't understand what she was doing, even though she was famous and had an uptick of clients, they didn't really get it. Or they got some of it, but without the rest of the context, the thing that goes on might be hollow, or misinterpreted, or appropriated, speciating into something else. There's a lot of strength in that kind of vulnerability, doing the work, and knowing that something totally different might be what endures. In other words, this story touches on a lot of what these annual events are trying to do. To give a kind of backstage peek into what Artemis Rising is, Artemis Rising began as an effort to showcase the work of authors who have been underrepresented in traditional publishing. 
For us at PodCastle, Cast of Wonders, Pseudopod, and Escape Pod, the work goes a little deeper. Artemis Rising is a conscious effort to put our most dedicated volunteers in the driver's seat. Rachel K. Jones, who recruited both me and Kalita to PodCastle, said that men are promoted based on their potential and women are promoted based on their resume. Artemis Rising is a way for us to put credit on resumes for women, for non-binary folk, for trans folk, people of color, the disabled, and the disadvantaged. The conversation around access and opportunity has changed a lot in the past five years, and AR will evolve as part of that conversation. As we close out Artemis Rising 5, please join me in thanking Crystal Claxton and Delora Gatz for their insights, their dedication, and for bringing their perspective to the show. If you liked what you heard, be sure to follow Elora Gatz to Giganotosaurus, where she is taking over as senior editor. And keep an eye out for the latest Crystal Claxton story wherever fine internets are sold. And that concludes this week's episode and this year's cycle of Artemis Rising 5. On behalf of everyone here at PodCastle, our audio engineer Peter Baravesh, our forum moderator Aussie Cat, our co-editors Jen Albert and Sheree Clark, along with all of our fantastic first readers, Matt Dovey, Arun Jiwa, Aidan Doyle, Ebony Dunbar, Devin Martin, Ace Ratcliffe, Orion Rodriguez, Julian Jarbo, Craig Jackson, Julia Pat, Hamilton Perez, Eleanor Wood, and most especially, Crystal Claxton and Delora Gatz. Thank you for letting us share another story with you. Podcastle is part of Escape Artists Incorporated and is distributed under the Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives 4.0 International License. Feel free to share it, but don't change it or sell it. If you like what you heard, head over to patreon.com slash EA podcasts and subscribe. We'll be back next week with another tale. See you then. <laughs>